Ryan Brown. Uh, I am the PIO for this incident. Uh, this incident is called the Butternut Fire. It's located in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, I want to start by uh, giving you a, a brief synopsis of what brought us here today. Uh, in the early twilight last evening, Great Barrington Fire Department was notified that there may be a wildland fire on East Mountain, which is the range behind us. Um, by nine o'clock, they had crews on the fire and they had determined that the safety of the crews was very important because of the dangerous terrain. So they went into an overwatch position, um, which basically means they observed the fire from a safe distance, making sure that the public and the firefighters were always kept safe. Early this morning, we started mobilizing local crews uh, for the purpose of fighting this fire. We have a number of agencies involved, which I will run down. But first, I want to introduce to you Chief Fire Warden of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Dave Salino, that is going to talk about the fire hazards that Massachusetts has been faced with. Uh, tremendous problems this year. Dave? All right, thanks. Um, yeah, folks, so I'll just uh, give you kind of a state overview. I'll give you a regional overview as well. Um, we find ourselves here. It's a story that really started it really started in end of September, or actually end of August, and then through September. So through September, we had um, all of a sudden a rapid onset of a, of a big rainfall deficit. Uh, we worked ourselves into October. So October is a repeat where we, in some cases, the most rainfall we had was um, a, a maximum of like a half an inch, right? And then we work ourselves into November, we find ourselves getting continuously into that same drought pattern. Um, in October, we saw wildland fire activity ramp up. And on the six year average in Massachusetts, we typically would see anywhere from 15 to 20 uh, wildfires in the month of October. And we went over 200 fires now this year in October. And in November, on the six year average, just to give you uh, sort of a feel for the extent of the situation, six year average is about 20 wildfires in the month of, uh, of November. And we just went over 400. Uh, with big acreages, large fires, and it's all the result of drought-driven uh, indices across the state. So it's lack of rainfall to start with. The lack of rainfall has a huge effect on the fuel conditions in the forest. And so every day that we go with, um, with no rainfall, lower humidities, dry air, and then drying winds like we're seeing today with wide open skies and direct sunlight, those fuels are just cumulatively, consistently drying out more and more every single day. And it's the larger fuels now that are the problem. It takes a long time to dry those 8 inch or 10 inch logs or those dead standing trees. It takes a long time to dry those out. And they are dried out now where they are burning easily and being consumed in any one of these fires that takes hold. And so that's what we find here um, in Great Barrington on the Butternut Fire. That's the scenario. You can see the fire behavior behind us. Um, that fire is chewing through that uh, pine stand up there on the ridge top. It's a backing fire right now, but it's a backing fire against the wind because all of that pine needle duff underneath it is super dry. It is ready to burn. Um, so there's another factor that influences fire behavior and you have to have an ignition, an ignition source. We have not had any thunderstorm development in October or November with lightning. And so that we know that all of these fires are human caused fires. So there's a human behavior factor. And so most communities across Massachusetts have burn bans in effect. Other neighboring states in New York, it's the same thing and Connecticut, it's the same thing. But day after day, our local fire departments are responding to illegal burns in the backyards of residences or campfires. Um, many of these fires are starting from abandoned campfires. And so our message is just simple. Until we get a break in the action here, weather-wise, please, please follow the warnings and the messaging that you are seeing out there. It's, it's for real here. Um, there have been two firefighter fatalities in our region um, at the start of this wildfire run, one in Connecticut and one in New York. Um, from folks fighting these fires. And we've had a lot of near misses um, from dead snags coming down. That's why um, the folks here at the Great Barrington Fire Department made the right decision to not engage in this fire last night. Um, this is not threatening any values at risk. 
and uh, and it's and it's doesn't there's no benefit to putting lives at risk um, ahead of it. So um, so that's what we're facing, and uh, and we ask the public to really cooperate with us um, through this till we get out of this with snow on the ground. Is any part of this contained yet? There's no containment on this. Now, to get containment, you really have to anchor that fire to something solid um, where it's not gonna burn, it's not gonna break out of the perimeter. And a fire like this that's rugged uh, in the, the, the terrain that it's in, um, it is not uncommon to see days go by uh, until you see some sort of containment. And that's by, you know, getting cold suppression, you know, out along the perimeter. And um, these are gonna be long events. How do you tackle a fire like this one? It's a well-organized effort. First of all, it's a huge uh, collaborative effort and a, and a uh, partnership. In Massachusetts, the local jurisdiction has responsibility for the fire. So it's the local fire departments that are bearing the weight on these responses. And then we bring in the state partners. We're here to help them out with our wildland fire um, experience and uh, organizations like the Emergency Management Agency uh, Department of Fire Services. We all bring support logistically, you know, mainly, and then um, and then um, kind of um, subject matter experts and you know, in, in wildland fire to the table. How much property was lost in this fire? Well, there's no property lost actually. Um, so fire is a natural event on the landscape, right? So, so one of the things is this this forest is burning today, and it, it's not the first time that it's burned, and it's probably not going to be the last. So the fire effects are a natural effect on the forest. But to date, uh, we don't have a, a clear acreage on it because we haven't had a chance to really accurately map it yet on the ground. But it's a large fire. It's probably gonna go at least 100 acres, you know, um, and it's gonna change. You can see it sort of slowly progressing in size um, up there today. I see that you guys also have a helicopter up there pouring water on yeah. it. Is that the best way to handle fire like this on top of trying to mitigated to a certain area? Yeah, it, the tactic makes sense because it's really difficult to put firefighters right directly on the line on the steep ground that's up there. And again, we talked about that. What's our number one priority here today? It doesn't matter what size the fire gets. Um, that's a natural effect on the landscape. But what does matter is that every firefighter comes off of that hill safely and returns home tonight and gets ready for the next shift. Um, so that's the first priority. How long did you uh, we've got fires um, this size uh, across the state that are going into the third and fourth week. Uh, and this is really like it's a fire situation that is somewhat comparable to what we see out west. It's different, different landscape, a different fuel type, but, it, um, but the conditions are, are similar, right? It's drought driven, so these fires are going to burn deep. Um, they're going to burn in heavy fuels, and it just takes, it's going to take a long time. It takes a season ending event now which shouldn't be that far off, right? We, you know, it's, it's snow or it's gonna be several days of precipitation that really soaks into the fuels. How close to this fire really getting out of hand um, did, did we come? Um, well, the one thing in our favor is that uh, we had winds yesterday in the eastern half of the state today, we're getting the winds still, but in the western part, um, the winds subsided on us. We're getting kind of a gentle northerly um, breeze today um, but the winds um, are part of that weather element that we have, have really dogged us here mm -hmm. um, intermittently every other it seems like every other day or two days so when you get winds behind you get 20 mile an hour winds behind this fire behavior in this terrain it's called alignment so the terrain lines up the humidity lines up the fuel moisture and the dryness lines up and then you add wind to it and that's what creates rapid rates of spread. They gave us a break today and, and gave us nice light winds. So that's why you're not seeing, you know, a huge amount of spread up there. Just to clarify, firefighters are kind of keeping their distance. There's no one like directly on the ground there's, in proximity. There's crews up there, um, but they're um, very um, strategic in where they put themselves um, and uh, putting leaf blower lines in. We blow the leaf litter away and create fire line. and. And so they're picking away at that so that at some point over the next few days and with maybe with the precip on Thursday, as we're all hoping for, um, we'll give uh, that fire a chance to sort of back into some containment lines. And that's when all of a sudden you start to see the containment percentage up here on the, on the map.
Just well, to let's talk about the precipitation. Like, what's that look like, and what's that going to impact the fire? We'll take any precipitation right now. Um, you know, the prediction is uh, the beauty about this. The prediction is like a half an inch to an inch of precip, maybe an inch and a half in some parts of the state. That's not great news. Uh, we'll take more if, we, if, if anyone has it, because we're about seven inches in a, in a precip deficit across most of the state. Um, what we will take is the duration of a day or a day and a half, followed by colder temperatures. So that means whatever rain drops onto, those, onto that leaf litter and those fine fuels, it's not gonna instantly evaporate. So what we're hoping for is that we get at least two or three days of a break in the action where we're not going to get easy ignition. The problem is, is behind this is another dry air mass that comes out of Canada. Um, and, and then, you know, we're back in the game with, with not a lot of precipitation predicted in the next eight to 14 days. Just to confirm, in your opinion, was the public ever in danger? There's no values at risk on this just by its proximity. Um, if it, and again, it's weather that has played that that influence. So yesterday was a north a northwest flow, meaning it's coming in off of this valley and kind of blowing it up slope and it hit the ridge top. So there's no structures downwind of that for quite a ways. And so the fire hits that ridge top and actually kind of it breaks its momentum, if you will. Although it is backing slowly down the other side, but it's a slow rate of spread. And so, um, so there's no values at risk um, immediately downstream and uh, downwind of it um, at this point. No evacuations either? No, no, not that I know. How many crews do you have? Yeah. So uh, we have approximately 80 assets on the fire right now in between command staff and ground crews. Um, because of the informidable terrain, uh, there's a lot of this fire we, we, we can't reach. So uh, the ground crews are, are doing the best that they can, uh, keeping the fire at bay. But really, um, if you look, that's a lot steeper than it looks. And um, some of you that have been around remember about 30 years ago, we did have a tornado that came through that same spot. So there's a lot of vegetation and stuff that's making it very dangerous for crews to move in there safety of the firefighters and safety of the taxpayers was always our first priority so about 80 people on the ground but i want to reinforce what what uh, uh warden salino said at no time was the public engaged by this fire some people thought it looked pretty close but we had a close eye on it and uh, at no time was the public in danger um i do want to acknowledge a lot of our partners are from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have the Department of Fire Services, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, Massachusetts State Police, Massachusetts Army National Guard. Uh, locally, all abutting departments to the town of Great Barrington have sent responses to assist us, as well as Southern Berkshire Ambulance Service, our good friends at NEMA, the Mass Emergency Management Agency, uh, the Berkshire Sheriff's Department, and uh, especially the town of Great Barrington as a whole, all town employees have been mobilized to support this effort, as well as the people of Great Barrington have been wonderful to us. If I can use that as a good transition, um, anyone that wishes to donate uh, to this cause, we are accepting donations at the Clear uh, Claire Teague Senior Center from 8.30 to 3.30 today and 8 30 to 3 30 tomorrow if you choose to bring water you can bring it to right here where we are at the press place and we'll disseminate it out to the crews from here um, one caution to the people in town with the cooling temperatures tonight and still active fire on the hill we can expect smoke to lie low that is always going to be a health concern um, so we can expect to see that smoke as we see it pluming right now as it cools down tonight that smoke to lay lower so people to the south and west may experience the smell of smoke or actually see smoke we will have people monitoring the scene throughout the night mostly with drones and um, no one will be allowed to be in harm's way um, one other comment 
the bridge on Brush Hill Road, which has been closed, uh, was opened this morning in an emergency effort uh, because there is a youth camp immediately on the other side of the bridge. Our initial concerns were for the youth that are still at that camp. It's still a very active camp. That was the safest and best way for us to move crews in there to take immediate action this morning. Uh, the bridge will be closed because it is relatively unsafe. And when it does get reopened tomorrow for emergency traffic only, it will be monitored by police. Um, aside from that, uh, there was a question of where all that water that the helicopter is bringing earlier is coming from the snowmaking pond at Butternut Basin Ski Area, which as the crow flies is less than a mile from where the fire is. It's just on the other side of that ridge. Um, I'll open it up to any quick questions. So despite the drought, the, the lake or the pond where that water is coming from has been a good resource or has been a challenge to get water? It's holding up right now. Um, we are looking at other resources for the bucket to use. That was the closest pond identified by the air crews and they thought that that would service us the best at this time. Should that pond become diminished, we will move further out to other bodies of water. Has there been any determination of really specifically how and the exact spot that this fire began? There has not been a determination of uh, the exact spot. We can safely assume because there's been no lightning, there is no yeah. electric utilities or anything up there, that it was most probably man-caused. As Warden Salino did indicate, most of the fires that we've seen are of human cause. And like I said uh, earlier today at our morning press briefing, my friend Smokey Bear wants you to prevent forest fires. I think that's going to do it for us today. We do not have another scheduled press briefing today, but we will be operating at this site again tomorrow.